Welcome back. So uh, we stopped our previous lecture by looking at uh, a general block diagram of the hybrid force motion control law design based on feedback linearization. We mentioned that uh, this is performed in a special space, which we have called task space, associated to a task frame. Uh, and we have used the parameterization of the uh, free motion direction using scalars S and of uh, the contact wrenches uh, using uh, scalars lambda. Uh, we have seen also that we need to make a filtering of measures from the actual uh, measurement from sensor that we have on the robot, so encoder position and implicitly velocity. And, and the factor force and uh, torque from the for, uh, force torque sensor mounted uh, at the final flange. This general scheme uh, applies to any type of uh, hybrid control. We have also concluded that it covers also limit cases when we have uh, only motion control or only uh, generalized force control. Now, there are cases which are simpler and uh, in which we can use a simplified version of the scheme. In fact, this was the original version proposed uh, by several authors and then we modified it to make it more consistent. So, uh, you can see uh, in this slide that mm, there are only um, natural quantities, no S, no lambda, nothing like this, because in fact the single component of the generalized force, which we denote here as capital F, so with uh, a linear force F and torques M, and of the general uh, generalized velocity, which contains the linear velocity and the angular velocity, the single components of this vector can be used, in fact, for parameterizing the task. Accordingly, the two matrices uh, Y and T uh, are in fact only uh, selected columns of the 6x6 six six matrix, uh, identity matrix. So it will be a selection matrix made by zeros and 1. This is also what you find in the textbook, in fact. So uh, let comment here uh, the principle is exactly the same. So we are doing a, a, a feedback linearization in the task space. But let's start first with uh, reminding where are the quantities measured and then compared. Uh, for instance, we have a, on the robot side, we have a force measure, so in the sensor, uh, force or sensor in the frame of the sensor, typically mounted on the end effector, and we have some sensor kinematics. Uh, the block is intended to make the transformation of this measured force into a force defined in the base frame, so in a common frame. Uh, similarly, the uh, robot kinematics in the block below the robot block at the end of the, of the diagram uh, includes the differential kinematics. So from measurement of the Q and Q dot, uh, we will compute through the differential kinematics also the generalized uh, velocity. And this is typically expressed in the base frame. So FC and V are both defined in the same frame. Now the R matrix, which is present on both channels, will transform this quantity into the task frame that we define as RFT, so reference frame task. Now uh, after that we select the component and this selection is done by uh, two matrices, uh, sigma on top and I minus sigma on top, which are in fact uh, the selection matrix with, uh, uh, with zeros and one in their columns. So in the force loop we will uh, select only the uh, admissible reaction forces that we are um, evaluating. In fact, there could be extra component in the FC vector which are simply neglected. No? So those that are not consistent with the model of the interaction task. Uh, these forces are compared with the desired forces in the task space, you generate an error and you have a controller that generates, generates the force control loops, uh, those that we labeled in general with lambda. Now lambda is not needed because 
uh, we can use uh, components, as I said, of F or M as a parameterization of this uh, reaction forces. In much the same way, and complementary to uh, the previous loop, we have the velocity loop, so we rotate the velocity in the task frame by the same matrix R, we select complementary, so where there's a 1, there's a 0, uh, and vice versa, uh, from uh, the diagonal matrix uh, identity, uh, and those are the velocities that are feasible, so those that are uh, comply, or better say, that um, are not um, barred from the presence of the environment, so the free motion direction. Again, we compare with the reference value, we generate an error, we have the velocity controller, for instance, a, a PD version of this, in fact, velocity, but this can include also an integral term and, have, and be the position control uh, with a PD in that case. Uh, the two commands are complementary, so they uh, are integrated because uh, each component of AF and AV act on a different direction of the task space, so we build the full uh, in general six-dimensional vector A, and this task acceleration through kinematic transformation, which involves the passage back from the task to the Cartesian, from the Cartesian to the joint space, and then we get an acceleration T double dot plugged into the uh, dynamic model we have the nonlinear feedback generation control in this block that generates the torque. So we have exactly the same scheme as before, but now without introducing the extra term because these are simple tasks. Okay, there are other possible modifications. One that uh, is quite interesting for me is the fact that despite we assume that there are, in the nominal case, direction that are constrained by a stiff environment. So in that direction we cannot have velocities, eh? we can only control forces. Uh, there are situations in practice, and this is why this formalism applied also to the non-ideal ideal case, where the contact in those force control direction is in fact uh, with limited stiffness. So there is no uh, rigid contact, but a finite stiffness, namely a compliance, um, that can be used uh, for designing still a force control in that direction. So the, uh, the task frame is actually in this context uh, only a selection of direction where to control force and where to control motion. In the force control uh, direction you can assume that everything is rigid and apply the method that we have seen before. So after feedback linearization and decoupling you close uh, uh, feed forward of desired force plus an integral term of the error. However, you can use, uh, you can design a force controller in that direction, mimicking uh, a behavior of an impedance model. And let's see how this is done. In fact, this is what we have implemented originally in our experimental setup, and I will show uh, immediately some videos of what we have done. So within a hybrid force motion uh, framework, the force control direction are, uh, we design a force control loop in the force control direction using a special impedance model. So let's consider that this direction is uh, one axis and let x be the position of the robot and the factor along such a direction. x desired will be the content, uh, contact point, so we count displacement from this uh, position where there's a pure contact when x equal to xd, uh, the contact will have a finite stiffness. Now we have seen that if we model with a spring the interaction between robot and environment, uh, a single spring may cover uh, essentially three cases. When the robot as a whole is stiff and the environment is uh, compliance, or when the environment is stiff and the robot has some compliance, typically at the uh, forced or sensor mounted on the defector, we know that some deformation should occur within the sensor in order to be able to measure force at all, or when we have both situations and what is in between the two springs modeling the sensor stiffness and the environment stiffness is in fact a negligible mass. 
then we have seen that there's an equivalent, equivalent single spring uh, stiffness that we can consider uh, in place of the series. So typically here we assume that, uh, for instance, Ks is the sensor stiffness or whatever we have in that uh, direction and we know, uh, we know usually the sensor stiffness, so this is more convenient, otherwise we have to estimate something here. And FD will be the desired contact force in that direction. This is completely different from the impedance model where we do not regulate the, co the contact force, uh, but essentially we keep the, them limited by suitable choice of the parameters in the impedance model. Now, in this case, we choose as impedance model in that direction the following one. So, uh, an apparent mass or inertia, if you wish, and M, with some uh, desired damping dm, m stands for model in this case. And now the third term, the stiffness, however, is not a free choice. It is in fact Ks times x minus xd, which is nothing else than the measurement by the force sensor, if Ks can be taken as the force sensor stiffness, so the most compliant element in the context. So only uh, the apparent inertia and the apparent damping can be chosen as three parameters in this impedance model. On the right hand side, we see that uh, we would like to react to the desired contact force. Typically, Fd is constant, but not necessary. So if this is the model, uh, and if we have applied feedback linearization before, so we reached uh, a situation where in the direction x, we have a, a double integrator uh, behavior, so x double dot equal a of x. Now, with this special, uh, the simplified impedance model at hand, we generate the command so as to impose uh, that model to the acceleration. So the a of x, the uh, input command on the linear side of the problem, will simply be 1 over the apparent mass uh, if you bring Ks x minus xd to the other side, and remember that this is the sensed uh, force, you will create a force error, Fd minus Fs, and you will bring also on the other side the uh, damping. So what results is that what you're doing in that direction is a P regulator, so proportional to the uh, force error, so a P regulator of the desired force, and you had a velocity damping, so without the need of any differentiation of the force measurement, which is always a bad choice, in fact. So this is very uh, nice, also because you can apply this even before getting in contact. So the same control law, without requiring any switches, can be adopted before the contact, while approaching the surface. So in that case, the measured force is zero, and uh, you can, uh, by the choice of positive uh, gain, so mm and, and dm in particular, in, in that uh, impedance model, uh, you can recognize that uh, you start from uh, uh, rest, uh, you get a force uh, in that direction Fd, and this will let the system start to move, but because of the damping dm, you will reach uh, a steady state speed. And this steady state speed can be computed by zero in the acceleration x double dot or the a of x, which is equivalent in that uh, formula, which gives that the steady state speed at which you will approach after some initial transit, the uh, surface uh, will be proportional to the desired force, but you can uh, reduce it by a suitable damping value dm uh, large enough. At some point you will get in contact and without changing the control law you will regulate force. So this is a very nice behavior which is typical of the impedance model scheme that does not need to change its structure while transiting from free space to uh, contact space. But here uh, you can use this feature also within a, an explicit regulation of the force. I think that this is very nice. And in fact, this is what we originally implemented in one of the first, I would say, worldwide experiment on hybrid control, including the full dynamics of the robot and realizing uh, feedback linearization.
So at that time, and you can see that it's many, many years ago, maybe a, a, a bit embarrassing, but you should not consider this uh, as a limitation. Uh, we received a donation from the research center of the FIAT, um, now FCA, from Torino, um, so the, which had a, a, a section which is the ancestor of the current Comau company producing robot and automation system worldwide. We received in donation uh, this prototype, which was called uh, MIMO. Uh, I think that the acronym stands for multi uh, operation manipulator, and something like this. Uh, completely naked. So, this was a six degree of freedom robot um, with harmonic drive. So, I will describe it uh, uh, in the first video, which is essentially uh, describing the, uh, the setup and then a few. Uh, initial experiment. Then the second video will describe exactly the uh, hybrid force velocity controllers. So uh, naked means that it had no software at all. It has the power electronics for driving the motors. Uh, we equipped it with a, a, a Hungarian four-star sensor. Uh, so let's see uh, how this worked at uh, that time. So this is the four-star sensor. It's a, a very efficient one. We mounted a rubber nose and we will see why this. And this is the full structure. Uh, it's the view. It's uh, very uh, homemade. So it's a six-hour manipulator with a spherical wrist, uh, DC motors with harmonic drives, and uh, a set of springs which are not seen from this side. They are be beyond, which compensate gravity. Now, the force sensor was a six-dimensional force sensor uh, with one kilohertz of data rate, which was very, very um, an excellent performance at that time. Uh, it became a uh, standard in uh, 80 product 10 years later. Now, the first experiment is uh, force control. So we regulate force. Uh, if we push before the force or sensor, the force or sensor is not sensing any force, the reference for the force is zero, so the robot stays, stays at the same place. But if we push and pull the nose, uh, the motion will uh, follow. So this is a kind of a joystick for the, for the robot. As the sensor senses forces, the motion will command in the direction of the sensed force, so the joint will move accordingly until the force is being reduced. Of course, if you continue to push and pull, the robot will follow you. Now, uh, this type of behavior has a problem because uh, the velocity that you realize, uh, that you realize as a reaction to the sensor force, at uh, the Cartesian level, should be implemented with joint command. Now, if you invert velocity, you encounter singularity of the Jacobian. So we implemented at that time uh, a, a robust singularity uh, singularity robustness scheme, so uh, a damped least square. And you see that if you're bringing the robot close to a singularity with the second and third link being stretched, uh, there could be a very large velocity being generated, but these are in fact damped. So by pulling and pushing the end effector and sensing forces, still you see that there, there is some acceleration close to the stretch configuration, but nothing too dangerous. So this was preliminary to what we've done, and in the third experiment, the last in this uh, video segment, uh, we are approaching uh, exactly with the control that I showed before. In the approaching phase, we have a constant speed regulated by the parameter of damping along that direction, and then we contact and we apply, uh, in this case I think it was 20 Newton. Now, to understand how old this uh, video is, uh, you may see now some VCR screen from the uh, IBM XT computer that we are using for uh, programming the controller, and you see that uh, the force had been regulated to 20 Newton uh, after initial uh, transient approach. Now, the second uh, video uh, deals with uh, more experiment or four experiments. 
The first one is really a hybrid task. So the robot gets in contact with the environment, touching it with its rubber nose, and then moving straight along the straight line. This is another view. We put some choke at that time in order to understand what was going on. And at the, uh, the motion was a trapezoidal profile with a peak of uh, 0.1 meter per second. And we switch from 0 to 20 to 40 Newton in the normal direction, as you have just seen in the VCR plot. And this noisy signal is just around 10 to the minus 4, which are the uh, position error along the tangent and along the normal on the plane. The second experiment, so the fifth in a row, we increase the maximum speed, so you will see a faster motion of half, almost half a meter per second. And again, here at the mid of the trajectory, we, vary, we, we change the reference force uh, along the normal from 20 to 40 newton meters. And here you can see the trace, you can uh, realize that the trace of the choke, uh, of the rubber on the choke, uh, enlarges when the uh, force is being uh, regulated from 20 to 40 newton meters. So you push more on the surface and the uh, rubber finger will enlarge. You see here the variation from 20 to 40 uh, newton in the normal force to the surface. And again, along the tangential direction of the straight line and the normal to the straight line on the plane, the position error is limited to 10 to the minus 3, so uh, let's say 10 to the minus four, uh, 2 or 3, uh, so less than, less than uh, around, some, sorry, around millimeters. Now uh, let me stop here, uh, because this is important, I would like to come back to this. Now the sixth experiment is in fact uh, a step disturbance. So we assume that the table was flat, horizontal, but in fact uh, we included uh, a step disturbance. So at some point, while moving and regulating forces, there's a jump. And in fact, this shows the transient by the chosen parameter, and the normal force, having been regulated to 40 Newton, has a sudden decrease to zero and then recovers. And you have seen uh, the other parameters are exactly the same. So tangential velocity and normal velocity in the plane are not affected. They remain with very small error. And this is a ramp disturbance. Now we are ramping up. So the orientation of the surface is changing. But contact is still guaranteed. Although in that phase, because we are not recognizing any uh, change of orientation, you see that the force has a peak and then returns to the desired value. Now, if we uh, all the other quantities are exactly the same, so uh, and this is the final, the final uh, hello by the robot. Now, uh, there's a one consideration to be made here. These are the reference paper that you can uh, access uh, very easily in uh, Explore. Uh, so the main issue here is, uh, indeed, when there's a jump in the, in the environment or if there's a, a variation of orientation, uh, the filtering effect of the hybrid force velocity control just neglect uh, the components which are measured, in fact, by the set force sensor, which are not only uh, normal to the surface, I mean, they are normal to the surface, but not to the expected one. So those components are just filtered out. As well as the component, due to the friction at the contact, which is large, because you, you have a rubber finger on a uh, plastic table, let's say. Uh, so there will be some friction while moving, especially when we're pressing on, on the surface. So the, norm, the tangent component of force, which is measured by the force force sensor, is just uh, discarded. No? So we are regulating just the normal force. Because on the uh, plane, on the tangential motion uh, to the path on the plane, this extra force opposes motion, but is seen as a disturbance to be rejected by the control. So the fact that we achieve still the desired velocity and we follow the position uh, of our trajectory on the plane, 
despite the presence of this extra force, uh, is thanks to the controller in the motion direction that reject this force disturbance. And of course, something similar happens in the complementary direction. Okay, uh, indeed, uh, however, uh, and we will see that this information can be used to make things better. So to estimate online the fact that the orientation of the surface has changed and possibly also continuously. So let's see uh, uh, at this point uh, what happens in the real world. So what are the sources of inconsistency when we get force and velocity measurement from the robot and from its force or sensor? Uh, and they are different from what we expect the model to be, the interaction model to be. So the first uh, uh, cause of this inconsistency is the presence of friction at the contact, like in the previous cases. So, uh, typically we see in the free motion direction, which is tangent to the plane in the previous experiment, uh, we measure a force that comes from the interaction, so it's a reaction force uh, that opposes motion in general, although there should be none if the environment was perfectly a geometric one, zero friction at the contact, geometric orientation correct. Uh, by the way, there's another coupling effect here, because in case of a certain uh, form of friction, like Coulomb friction, uh, the force that opposes motion along the tangent, so on the plane, its intensity depends, increases with the applied normal force. So these two components should be, in fact, decoupled. There should be none, no force on the, on the, on the plane, uh, and only force reacting from the environment along the normal to the plane. Okay, in this case, this phenomena couples that the more we apply uh, force normally, despite the nominal decoupling, in fact, there's a coupling because of this uh, unmodeled effect of friction, and the coupling increases, uh, so in the direction where we control uh, motion, we will see uh, a more dis a larger disturbances that we have to neglect. So this is uh, a first uh, effect. The second effect is the presence of compliance. No? We assume that everything is rigid. Then we have seen that uh, we can adapt the for hybrid force velocity, uh, force motion control uh, scheme to the presence of some compliance in the contact, um, essentially at least the one related to the uh, stiffness of the sensor, which is finite. Uh, and, and then we can design a force control loop using the impedance paradigm in that di direction. However, the compliance in the structure may be at the contact, as we see, for instance, in the sensor, or, for instance, in the nose, let me call this uh, rubber um, object the nose of the robot, which is indeed uh, compliant, so the contact will, uh, uh, position of the contact will be not uniquely defined, but there's also other compliances, as we have seen in the uh, scheme for force control, uh, that comes from the robot structure itself, for instance, the, the transmission of the joints, uh, the joint transmission that introduce some compliance, which means that if we measure encoder position at the motor, and we have, for instance, transmission compliance, and we compute with this motor position and their numerical de derivative, the velocity at the end effector, so beyond the tra compliant transmission, then we may compute uh, or uh, obtain velocity, velocities in some direction that are nominal, nominally constrained. So it's like saying, oh, I'm penetrating the, the surface according to my measurement. Okay, So there's a mismatch of this. So you, you may have velocities where you don't expect uh, to have because of the constraining environment. And this is caused by the compliance and the uh, full chain that you're considering. Now, if, however, the geometry of the contact is perfectly known, uh, then the fact that we are getting forces measured along direction where we don't expect them, or we're getting measured velocities or computed velocity based on measurement 
along direction where we don't expect to have velocities, this is automatically, uh, these inconsistencies are automatically handled by the filtering of the pseudo inversion uh, with the matrices of the matrices T and Y, which generates the actual parameter S and S dot and lambda that are used for the control law. So this is being recovered. We avoid, as I said at the beginning of this lecture, uh, we avoid with the hybrid uh, force motion control scheme, we avoid to become inconsistency in the control because of the fact that we are measuring things that are not consistent with our model. Of course, everything works if these inconsistencies are relatively small, so they can be uh, treated as mild disturbances. If I'm 90% off in understanding um, the orientation of my wall on which I have to contact, then things may become a disaster and we have to implement some adaptive scheme or some uh, online estimation. And in fact, uh, here comes the last point, uncertainty on the environment geometry. Uh, the first experiment that we performed were on flat surfaces. You will see uh, at the end of this lecture other such experiments made at the University of Naples by Professor Siciliano and his group, so the author of your textbook, um, around the same time, probably a couple of years later than the video that I showed before. So when you have uncertainty on, on the environment geometry, then problems uh, become more critical, uh, especially if you combine them with friction and compliance. However, uh, at that stage, uh, you can uh, decide to use all the information that you collect while executing the task, so while controlling velocity along the tangent direction to the surface and force along the normal direction. I'm now thinking of a, a three-dimensional task uh, in position without taking care of orientation, which is, as usual, a, a complication in terms of mathematics but the principle is exactly the same. So, uh, instead of throwing away what is not consistent with the model, we can use this information to update online, uh, in real time, uh, the model itself. And this can be done by the internal sensor uh, of the robot or by external sensor. For instance, if you have a vision, uh, a camera that overlooks the scene, so it can recognize uh, from the camera the geometry and so adapt uh, by sensing. So without having a, a, a priori model generate the model while the robot is moving on the surface. But for doing this, we have seen also in the introductory lecture on uh, uh, interaction with the environment that you can use force uh, in order to do this estimation. And uh, so let's consider now exactly this problem. So the question is how difficult it is to estimate an unknown profile uh, of a surface on which the robot is in contact using the information that comes from the velocity and force measurement. Again, force measurement by a force torque sensor. Velocity, there's not a Cartesian velocity measurement, a direct one, but it's uh, modulated by the Jacobian starting from the encoder measurement differentiated numerically. But this is a long story, I will not repeat it again, so assume that we have velocity and force measurement. So can we do something with this? Should we use velocity measurement? Well, if we expect that the velocity are tangent to the contact, if we measure velocity uh, in the Cartesian space, uh, we expect that that direction is the tangent to the surface. And similarly, if we use force measurement, and we expect that forces are always normal to the, to the surface, then by measuring those forces with a force torque sensor and doing the proper uh, rotation and transformation, we expect that the normal direction, the, the, the direction of the measured force is in the normal direction. So we have two complementary information about the tangent and the normal to the given surface, which is unknown a priori. But what happened? Uh, in the normal direction, which is the normal nominal direction of the measured force, because of friction, uh, what we sense, so the measured force, which is the violet vector here, uh, is slightly rotated from the normal. So we are controlling Fn, 
but in fact we are measuring F in violet and we have a tangential force which is proportional to a coefficient, this is a Coulomb friction, to the normal force that we are um, realizing and in fact this uh, coefficient mu can be given uh, the form of a tangent of an angle and the angle gamma is what is uh, killing us in a sense, we would like the gamma should be zero but in fact it's different from zero and we have a tangential force in our measurement which is not consistent with the uh, uh, geometric model so uh, should we use uh, the measurement F in violet to understand what is the normal to the surface this would be wrong in this case because the normal is in fact very avro on the other hand uh, with the velocities and we assume that the tangent direction is the nominal direction of the measured velocity so the tangent of the surface should be there but because of the uh, uh, associated uh, compliance that we mentioned what we actually compute so from measurement is a velocity the v in violet which is uh, pointing inside the surface Okay, so we have a small component along the actual normal to the surface, which is wrong. So we, as we imagine that the tangent is along the violet V, but in fact it's along the blue one, which is the correct tangent. But we cannot use uh, velocity information. So both type of measurement are affected by some physical phenomena that provide, produces inconsistent data. So the idea is to use both method in a mixing, eh? to do what is called, has been called over the years, sensor fusion. And we do this by using a recursive least square. So uh, essentially there could be many methods that can be applied. Uh, we estimated the tangent direction from position measurement using the recursive least square. So fitting data, eh? let's say polynomial data of uh, path uh, on the position measurement and updating the coefficient properly and once we have done this uh, we estimate also the friction angle gamma so that we can eliminate this effect uh, and we do this using both the current estimate of the tangent direction and the actual force measure in this way we can uh, use both sensor um, fuse them in a suitable way and update our model while we go on. Of course, once you have normal and tangent direction, uh, you can use this as uh, your task frame and this will move and rotate uh, accordingly to the progression of the task. Uh, there's a, an extra part, in fact, uh, when we um, lo lose contact or at the beginning where we are not in contact and we don't know where the environment is, of course, you have some bubbling operation, so you explore, according to a logic, where you expect to have a contact, so you move uh, s slowly in various directions until you get contact from the force measurement. From there on, you switch on your hybrid force velocity controller, or, as we have seen, you may not, have, not need to switch this because in the force control direction, an impedance-based law can be applied also in free space but indeed when you choose the direction to exploration this requires some exploratory logic and the same happens if in case you lose contact because you have a high curvature of your surface and you're proceeding with a high tangential speed there could be a situation where you uh, detach because you are not able to process data um, fast enough especially if the contact is particularly stiff so you have to recover contact again and you use the same logic, you go back and, and then you look for the uh, surface again with an exploration, a local exploration. So uh, we have done some experiment first on, a, uh, on an object, which I will show you later what was this object, but uh, essentially this was a, a, an object with a circular surface, so with a given radius. Uh, that we needed to trace at constant speed while applying the force. So remember that this estimation is being performed uh, in real time while we are already trying to achieve our hybrid task of force and motion control. So this is a, a purely position-based estimation of the tangent to the surface 
you see that while time progresses on the uh, x-axis there are uh, uh, samples, uh, samples at one millisecond probably, so there are ma many samples here, uh, and you see that the uh, tangent in degrees with respect to the horizontal goes from 100 degrees and then decreases until zero, so this is horizontal, and then changes to minus 100 degrees, and you see that there's a linear profile associated with the fact that the angle of the tangent is when you trace the circle at constant speed is changing linearly. Okay, and all the uh, bouncing that you find are related to some uncertainties that are residual to the presence of compliance, to the presence of friction, and all the effect that we have seen before. There are extra peaks which are related to a specific uh, nature of the object that we are uh, in contact with. So this is the estimation based on the tangent. Is this correct? We don't know. Uh, we don't know really. I mean, we, we know the object, so this was an experiment, not the simulation, made knowing the object just to compare the result. Indeed, you could do uh, the same using the force information from the, uh, from the uh, force torque sensor. Indeed, you're estimating the normal and then by 90 degrees the tangent. So to compare the two graphs, uh, here it is what happens if you're using only force information. Now here the peaks of force from time to time are larger and there's a clear explanation from this. So is this the correct one? Uh, again, uh, we don't know. Uh, if we compare the two uh, measurements, so we put at the same instant what we have estimated using a position-based uh, information and velocity indeed, or force-based information based on the force or sensor, we see that the difference uh, may be large, of the order of 7, 8, 10 degrees, with some larger peaks, and this is exactly when uh, the force has uh, a peak behavior in measurement. So, uh, there are, the two things are clearly different, and 7, 8 degrees of, on the average is quite a large error in orientation. So the idea is that probably better results could be obtained by doing sensor fusion. And in fact, here is the final result. The object, the mysterious object that I'm uh, talking about, is in fact uh, the contour of a film reel of a movie. Uh, the radius was 70 degrees. There are some uh, tags, uh, regular tags placed, uh, let's say, every 45 degrees, more or less, and these are the situation uh, where the force measured on the normal uh, has a peak, you know, because in fact it enters you know, for a while, expecting instead having a perfectly circular surface you know, to be uh, reproduced, or estimating the circular surface and then having a sudden variation. Of course, if the curvature uh, of the surface is large, the uh, effect on estimation will be more uh, sensitive. So uh, the recursive uh, the square combining uh, all the measurement and using data fusion for, for both the force and the position and velocity measurement uh, essentially uh, dealt with the update of polynomial fitting, quadratic polynomial fitting uh, locally to the surface and updating the coefficients of this polynomial. In this way, from the polynomial and from the local fitting, which combine the information, as I said before, so estimation of uh, a tangent and the correction of the uh, angle due to the friction, to the Coulomb friction, uh, from this functional uh, polynomial that we have fitted uh, and we are fitting recursively while we move on, we can compute the tangent and the normal and therefore regulate the force along the normal and the velocity along the tangent. This is a two-dimensional task, in fact, so we don't care about extra quantities. But this shows that you can do, and this is more or less exactly what we expected, so a radius of 70 centimeters uh, and uh, the shape which is uh, reminding quite closely the one of the uh, film reel, uh, and in fact also the small discontinuities at the center and uh, 45 degrees before and after, which corresponds 
to these tanks on the field below. In fact, uh, in the experiment, while identifying this surface, we have also kept the normal force equal to uh, 20 Newton. So this is regulated with the simultaneous motion and estimation and regulation of force. So the motion at a constant speed. And you see, again, the peaks coming uh, in correspondence to the discontinuity of the circular surface. Um, so these are corresponding to the technical term, are the grooves present on the film real uh, contour. Uh, so these discontinuities are detected. Now, uh, with this in mind, we perform a more general uh, contour estimation. In fact, we built uh, in-house a, a wooden profile. Uh, it's funny because I found this wooden profile, which now is uh, stored somewhere uh, in, in, in the lab. Uh, I found a, a similar contour, a contour in another uh, lab uh, around the world. So we didn't know even the exit surface, uh, we just uh, manufactured this uh, at home. And we used the uh, uh, MIMO CRF robot with the Hungarian uh, 64 star sensor for this, which is again uh, essentially uh, a 2D task. So this is a, um, a roller coaster profile, Montagne Russe in Italiano. Uh, that we should follow, so we have to detect the uh, tangent and the normal, and we do this while regulating the constant velocity along the current tangent and a constant force along the current estimated normal. Okay, so we do all the same estimation and highly control. And this is the result of our uh, method. In fact, uh, the first is an approach, so we are getting uh, in contact, uh, and then when we are in contact with star, you, you will see that there is some compliance in the finger here, there is another nose, but in fact something similar. The friction of the contact is very large because uh, we have a, a wooden to rubber contact, and you can imagine how large is the friction while sliding in the surface. And we are controlling both uh, quantities, tangential velocity and normal force. Here you see in a peak, this is very critical. Uh, we, we lost contact many times there because the curvature was relatively high. Of course, if you move slower, then the chance to uh, lose contact is much slower. If you go faster, then uh, because, of the damp uh, because of the sampling of quantities and the need to update command, not faster than, uh, I think here it was uh, 10 milliseconds, uh, then this could be dangerous. This is again the same task or a different run uh, as seen from a different view. And again, we use this recursive uh, least square. At the, end of this, at the end of this video, uh, you will see also uh, the reference paper if you're interested in it. It's a, it's a paper of 1992 by a member of the robotics lab at that time. Uh, the robotics lab was placed in San Pedro in Vincoli, uh, in uh, Via Rossiana, where the, a part of the garden was. It's 1992, in fact. Okay, so uh, this is uh, almost it. Uh, another application of uh, hybrid force velocity control is the one uh, shown here. In fact, you have seen this picture before. Unfortunately, I don't have a video of this, which uh, is an experiment conducted by a master student in an ABB uh, research center near Rome, which no longer exists. Unfortunately, they moved it to Milan. Um, but this is another hybrid force uh, velocity control but uh, implemented uh, in a poor man fashion on one side and in a more sophisticated on the other side. The poor man fashion is because the ABB here had a, a closed control architect. So we could not modify, in fact, the behavior of uh, the velocity of the end effect. But uh, this system had um, a special device for, let's say, debarring which consists of uh, this uh, rather heavy 
and the factor mounted on the flange of the six degree of freedom ABD robot, which carries a blade uh, which is pneumatically actuated. There's also an extra passive compliance in the, in the tool at the end effector, and all this should be used to remove the excess of material, which is a uh, special gluing uh, um, element by polyvinyl butyral, so PVB, which when, uh, when becomes cold, uh, it's quite hard. And this excess of material, which is used to glue together several glass layers to make up a, a car windshield, uh, the excess of this material uh, it comes out of the border, of the nominal border of the contour. So this should be eliminated before uh, mounting this car shield, this windshield on, on the car bodies. So uh, in this case, uh, the tangential velocity along the norm normal direction the, sorry, the tangential direction to the, to the nominal uh, shape, which has very sharp edges, as you can see. So if you really go down, stop, and then restart when you get to one of the quarter, was assigned to the controller, to the robot controller. On the other hand, the control of the normal force uh, was implemented uh, with suitable uh, force control scheme. So it's again a hybrid controller in which one part is uh, devoted to the uh, close architecture robot controller while the force direction is explicitly controlled. So the, the barring tool contains in fact two blades uh, for cutting the exceeding plastic material. The, one, the first one is actuated by the pneumatic actuator. The second is like the Gillette uh, 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 blades for uh, cutting your bed uh, is passively pushed against the surface and follows the first one so that you can remove the extra material that you may have cut with the first blade. Uh, in addition, we have a, a force sensing device here. It's just a 1D uh, force sensing. It's called the load cell, in fact, uh, because we only need to measure the force along the normal and we don't expect inconsistency in this sense. And moreover, on the tools there is a control system which, besides commanding the pneumatic actuator according to the load cell measurement and for regulating the forces, uh, this comes from the technological process, we know how much force we should apply, not too much, but not damaging the contour of the windshield, but not too little uh, in order to uh, avoid to removing this extra material. So the value of the force should be regulated from the technological aspect. So on board of the tool, there is a control system, but it's important that this control system is also exchanging data with the ABB robot controller, so using a, a local area network or an Ethernet connection in there. So, uh, and for this situation here, you can see uh, bit more detail, there was a thesis on, on, on that uh, word, uh, on top you see the physical system, so the robot carrying the base, uh, on the base there's a pneumatic actuators, there's some passive spring uh, connected to the uh, support where the load cell is mounted and measures um, forces, and then there's a blade support, the blade itself is uh, an elastic plate and is in contact with the uneven surface of the glass of the windshield. So this physical system corresponds to a very simple mathematical, uh, very simple, I mean to a, a, a mathematical model which has linear dynamics is made by masses and springs in series. You see the uh, position of the various element the X of the glass surface, which may have some disturbance on top. You can simulate this, for instance, before uh, realizing an experiment. There's a stiffness of the blade, there's a stiffness of the load, uh, of the load cell, in fact. There's a stiffness of the spring, the present between the pneumatic actuator and the load cell. And there are position of the various rigid bodies, including the robot, which may gets uh, closer or uh, more distance 
to the to the surface. And if you have such type of system and you're trying to regulate force, so measure uh, the difference in this case between the position x of the support of the blades x sub b and x of the support of the load cell. So the difference between these two variables would be uh, multiplied by the stiffness of the load cell would be the measured force which should, should be regulated. As you can see, you have some uh, workpiece dynamics which includes also the stiffness of the blade and you have some uh, dynamics before which is the spring of this uh, debarring tool so you have multiple mass spring uh, system and we have seen that the presence or absence of extra compliance may damage the regulation uh, loop so here uh, a PI controller was used for regulating forces if I remember well but the methods can be seen uh, I mean, at least proportional controller and their stability using linear models and root locus techniques uh, was already presented in one slide and you have an extra uh, technical paper in the material in the course website. So let's conclude uh, this uh, lecture with uh, looking at a few video which are uh, video clips extracted from a long, longer full video that is available again in the course website and these are experiments performed at the University of Naples now it's called Naples Federico II in 1994 using the Kumau smart robot that they had in their lab I think that this video, although historic uh, by, by now are very well uh, illustrating the various control at least uh, some of the controller that we have seen uh, so far from a theoretical point of view. So let's uh, look at this video, uh, it's about 10 minutes of the whole, uh, starting with the first one. Huh? First one is compliance control. Now remember that uh, in compliance control, uh, so you just modify the Cartesian stiffness of the robot and uh, you don't use a force or sensor. In fact, uh, from uh, this uh, uh, figures uh, from that illustrate uh, this miniature that illustrate the videos, you can tell that uh, under the hand of the researcher, which is grabbing the end effect of the robot in the compliance control scheme um, video, uh, there's no force or sensor. Uh, that uh, metallic flange uh, has no black object. The black object can be seen in the second and third and fourth, in fact, uh, miniatures. So, in the first case, there's no force or sensor. In the other cases, there is one. So, let's start looking at what happens with compliance control. So, in this case, uh, we can choose proportional gains at the Cartesian level. And we can have a stiff uh, control so with large proportional gain, so if we push, the robot will not move. And we can push in any direction if we have selected large uh, stiffness gains in the various direction. Indeed, uh, now if you use the same controller for tracking the path at a reasonable moderate speed, uh, this is a circular path in the Cartesian space, actually in a vertical plane, using the same gain that you have seen in the previous part of the video, which are those that will resist to forces applied to the, from the external part. Now, if you uh, reduce the uh, proportional gain, the robot will behave in a more compliant way, so will accommodate and then return to the same uh, initial position uh, when you're pushing or pulling and this can be made uh, six dimensional in a sense uh, now if with the same low gain you try to tra trace the same circular path as before with the same speed you can immediately realize that you're not doing really a circle and you can tell it from this video or uh, you can see it directly uh, on this VCR screen uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this before, it's like in our system. You see that 
uh, there was a, a circular path, uh, you can see it now, a circular path perfectly realized uh, when using large uh, stiffness gain in this compliance controller, and in fact you are doing a kind of an ellipse rather than a circular path when you're using low gains. Low gains, however, are associated to uh, a more compliant behavior. So, um, when you're putting, when you're adding a force to a sensor, then you can impose impedance control. And when you do impedance control, remember that you can uh, modify completely the apparent inertia at the end effector, or use the natural inertia, uh, and in that case you will not, uh, at the Cartesian level of the robot, and in that case you will no, no longer need uh, a measurement of force and torque. So in this case, uh, the authors have modified uh, also the inertia, so use the full impedance uh, model scheme, and they need, of course, uh, the force or sensor. Now, uh, I remind you that impedance control in the Cartesian space assign a desired mass spring damper behavior in all direction in a linear and decoupled way. And this is uh, realized through a preliminary feedback linearization control. Now, uh, you will see in, in this video now, uh, what is the behavior first in, uh, in free space? Uh, you see that uh, if you don't measure forces, uh, nothing moves. Let me stop for a moment this file. So in the in the uh, in the in what follows. So again, if you don't push beyond the force or sensor, there will be no excitation force to the model. So the model uh, is not feeling any contact force and is imposing a, a, a position and because there's no tracking here uh, with some gain that, that are related to the mass, stiffness, and damping. So it will essentially not move. But indeed, when you're pushing on the, on the end effector, it will react with uh, the given uh, choice of parameters. And now, in the following part, you will see how this uh, trends and changes when you change parameters. So, for the first case, assume that uh, the inertia parameters, so the mass and the damping parameters, uh, have been chosen. And... Uh, you see the behavior when you're uh, having a, a small or a, a large stiffness gain. Large stiffness gain corresponds to small displacement, like in this case, while low gains, stiffness gain, correspond to the large displacement, even the same uh, M and D and the same applied forces. Here you see that lower stiffness corresponds to larger motion and then when you release, uh, the robot will go back to the same position. Now you can uh, also uh, change, I mean, choose a stiffness and the mass, uh, apparent mass, and change the damping. If you use large damping, you have a small overshoot, but if you use low damping, like in this case, you will see oscillation overshoot with respect to the desired position. So you can see that those parameters play a very nice uh, role. Now you can also uh, use uh, an anis uh, anisotropic choice of parameter in the various Cartesian direction, so to be ve very stiff or very damp in some direction and differently in a another direction. And finally, uh, the robot is now executing. Uh, uh, I guess yes, a circular path, but uh, this circular path is then prevented by the presence of a box. And uh, when you're doing this path, what happens is that you execute exactly the path in free space and the robot becomes compliant when interacting. And for instance here, you see that in this, let's, let me stop this, uh, in this uh, VCR view, you can see the circular path. So the end effector is tracing the path in the free space. When it touches the uh, box, which is rather compliance, it's a carton bo box, uh, it will um, comply with the surface, 
and not execute, I mean, move on the tangent on, on the surface itself, so making an error in terms of position in order to do have this behavior, we should be sufficiently compliant, but not too compliant uh, in, our, in the truth of our model, so have uh, a stiffness parameter which is not too low, otherwise we would not trace correctly the circular part in free space, but if we are too stiff, then we will tend to enter the surface and apply large forces, and you see that the forces that arise in contact uh, are shown in the uh, second plot on the B BCR. Okay. Now, uh, the third video is in fact uh, pure force control. Let me uh, see what, what it is. So, uh, again, in, in this case, um, we, uh, the first part of the video will show something that we have seen before. So, uh, we push on the, um, on the force door sensor. I mean, if we push before the force door sensor, the robot is position control and will not move because it doesn't sense any force. If we push instead beyond the force door sensor and we set as a regulating force a zero value, then the robot will follow uh, the hand of the human that pull, pulls or pushes uh, the tip. So it's the joystick uh, characteristic that we have seen before. So let us uh, see uh, this first experiment and then we will comment on the following one. So you see that uh, as soon as you release, since there's no position reference, but just zero force reference, when you're uh, releasing uh, contact, the robot stops in the position that has been reached. Otherwise, you move it uh, like moving the joystick, I mean, pulling and pushing the robot from the nose. And uh, a sense of uh, direction, or let me stop here, uh, the sense of uh, mass that you see depends on the parameters that you have chosen uh, in the force controller. Now, uh, in Naples and also later on in different places, they have implemented uh, this scheme together with an inner uh, position control loop. What does it mean that the robot is in fact position controlled uh, at the Cartesian level or at the joint level now we imagine that this is made at the Cartesian level and the inversion is performed inside uh, the scheme, so with the uh, Jacobian inverse. Remember that this, control, this uh, robot has an open control architecture, open uh, CRS, uh, C, C, CR, oh, sorry, CS3 or something like that, is uh, an open facility made available by Comau, uh, for research purposes and beyond, so you can really modify the controller and, and enter at the current or torque level in these cases. So, uh, if you assume that inside there is a, a, a position control loop, so if you specify a position at the Cartesian level, the robot will reach that position. However, this reference position is not generated independently, but is the result of an external force loop. So if you specify a force loop, uh, a desired force, for instance, inside, uh, in the direction of the, of the carton box, so in the vertical direction, uh, and you're not measuring any, any forces, so the force controller will generate a command uh, of motion. And this command will be treated as a position reference by the inner position controller, and so you will try to reach this situation. Of course, uh, when you're getting in contact, then uh, the position controller will remain uh, unattended because you cannot really penetrate the surface, but uh, the external force loop has an integral term, so uh, it will apply more and more uh, force until it reaches the desired one. Okay? So this is what happens when you're having an internal uh, position loop which is driven by the output of an external force loop which includes an integral term and here we will see uh, the continuation so you get approach and then you will push 
enough until you reach the desired position. Of course, when you reach this desired position, you release uh, the controller, you move the robot away using force control. And here you see the resulting strike. In free motion, you're getting straight on the vertical until you touch the, the environment. And at that time, uh, you, uh, your reference of force will get to the desired one. Instead, if the inner loop is a velocity loop, you can see it also from the approach phases that uh, the end effector is uh, drifting from the vertical. Okay, it's drifting from the vertical, and even at the contact, there's a uh, there's a, a, a mistake by this type of loop, which is not recovered. So you're going down in the free space along a, a diagonal path, which is not the right one. Uh, and again, when you're in contact, you're not realizing the desired force. There's a residual steady state force at the contact. And there's an extra normal for, uh, tangential force which should not be there. So, in fact, uh, the message here is that you should use an internal position loop if you're doing this cascaded control with the external force uh, loop and an internal uh, motion loop. This is not what I proposed before, but is an example, uh, another example of the possibility that you have in this context. And finally, uh, in Naples, they implemented a couple of years later uh, than us also a hybrid force position controller on this Comao version, so an industrial arm, not the prototype that we have used. And in this case, again, uh, you have uh, a situation where uh, in free space you are controlling separately uh, a zero desired force on the horizontal plane so the robot will follow the hand but a very steep position control on the vertical so that you will not be able to move the end effector up and down while you're free to move the end effector uh, on the horizontal plane and the same is achieved uh, while in contact with the surface, so the tangential velocity is being controlled, the normal velocity is controlled to zero, and uh, so, sorry, the uh, orthogonal velocity on the plane is controlled to zero, and the normal force with an 80 sensor, as you can see here, is regulated to a desired value. And here you see that the straight path is perfectly traced, both geometrically and in time, so the speed along the path is being regulated while the normal force is being regulated as well using this hybrid control and knowing everything about the environment. There's no estimation of identification in this case. So uh, this concludes uh, this part and it concludes also the standard part on control. Uh, as anticipated, um, you will, uh, we will <coughs> treat with Professor Venditelli visual servant in the next lecture and we will resume then uh, with the final part uh, of the um, program which covers some se uh, seminarial type uh, uh, topics essentially uh, failure, detecting failure of actuators and possibly of sensor in a robot and the large chapter of uh, human-robot interaction under safety premises so collision detection and under active collaboration. Thank you for listening.